They say there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who find themselves and those who create themselves. Are you looking for purpose or deciding it for yourself? Will you plunge waiting for someone to catch you? Or will you jump and build your wings on the way down? Seek a path or carve a path. Wait for the future or build it. What is a school but a set of walls waiting for greatness? And who are you but someone destined to achieve it? Here, between the street and the jungle, against time and tide, we push and pull just like the currents. Our ocean of dreams will meet the odds ahead and rise above it all. The University of Guam, Center for Island Sustainability, leads and supports the transition of our island region toward a sustainable future through research, education, protection and preservation, growth, partnerships, and inspiration. Follow us on our journey to creating a sustainable future for our island and our world. Welcome to the fifth week of the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability. I'm your MC, Lawrence Waddell, the Guam Green Growth, Growth Coordinator from the University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability. As UOG's 11th conference continues, we're proud to be connecting islanders and their allies together with our very first virtual series. Through this platform, we have had over 1,200 logins on Zoom from over 60 countries, states, and territories, and thousands of views through our social media platforms. Whether you're returning or joining us for the first time, half a day, and we're happy to connect with you. Although the programs we have brought to you each week are unique and significant to island sustainability in their own way, today's program is even more special. To honor the traditional island wisdom from the Pacific region that will be shared with you today, we will start with a traditional blessing. Then, we'll have a panel on traditional seafaring navigation with Master Navigator Larry Regatal, co-founder of Wage and Lamatrek Yap. Vicente Diaz, the director of the Native Canoe Program at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And unfortunately, our third panelist, Master Navigator Nainoa Thompson, president of the Polynesian Voyaging Society in Hawaii, had a sudden family emergency and is unable to be with us today. In his stead will be Navigator Lahua Kamalu, Voyaging Director of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. This panel will be moderated by Rita Nauta, the Managing Director of Guampedia. After that, we'll have a 30-minute virtual networking reception hosted by Representative Sheila Babauta and Sammy Birmingham Babauta, who will be joining us from the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Now, let's get started with week five. Long ago on Guam, the center of the island was mysteriously wasting away. It was soon discovered that a giant fish was eating the land. The strongest men went out to sea to search for it, but over time could not find the fish. The women gathered together to help. They cut off their hair and wove it into a large net. They sang songs to lure the giant fish out of hiding and captured it. The men helped bring in the fish for a feast. Together, they saved Guam and secured its future for generations to come. Islands are not isolated. This is just one story of island wisdom that teaches we must all work together to face the threats to our planet and our future. Join the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability as we present the theme, Island Wisdom for a Global Future. 
Impacts of climate change and health emergencies expose both the vulnerability and resilience of island communities. As repositories of ancient wisdom, islanders carry lessons that can address some of the world's most pressing challenges. Today, we'll ask how can islanders help navigate the way to a sustainable global future? To start the discussion, I'd like to introduce the moderator of Ancient Winds, Navigating Tomorrow, Rita Pengalina Nauta. You may recognize her voice from earlier in our opening video telling the legend of how the Chamorro women saved Guam from the giant fish eating the island's coast. Rita is part of the Galaiti, Diaz, and Kotla clans of Santa Rita and the ancestral village of Sumai. Since 2011, she has been serving as the managing director of Guampedia, an affiliate program at the University of Guam. Guampedia.com has evolved into an accessible scholarly space documenting Guam's unique history, indigenous perspective, and public memories for the Chamorros of the Marianas. Working to further expand into our region of Micronesia, Rita has been collaborating with the traditional seafaring communities to promote Micronesian voyaging and produce culturally sustaining teaching strategies and instructional resources that reflect the region. Enjoy the panel. Half a day, 
Traditional navigation and seafaring is a very sacred realm, steeped in a code of conduct based on a profound respect and inter interconnectedness with all things living, and steeped in spirituality and the collective knowledge inherited from our ancestors who came before us. The traditional blessing that was bestowed upon the beginning of the session is really about permission. Um, because it is such a sacred knowledge, and Larry, who comes from the island of Lamatrek, uh, has come to the island of Guam, and his matrilineal elder from his mother's line came here to bestow on him protection um, with the knowledge that he's sharing, um, by the protection by the spirits, and to ask permission of the Tautautanu, the people of the land. And so the Chamorros that were represented at the end of the chant uh, are actually were at the canoe house, which is situated in Hagatnya. It is the traditional canoe where the representation of our Tao Tao Ta Tanu are welcoming Larry and uh, to our island and granting him permission and uh, gra uh, gratitude in sharing his knowledge. And we also welcome Vince Diaz and uh, Lehua Kamuli, who will be sharing with us in this journey, um, a very special journey. Um, in fact, our initial meeting was very powerful, and it brought to a uh, consensus to among all of us that this can really serve as a catalyst to convene conversations about ongoing efforts for survival, revival, and renaissance of traditional seafaring, and ultimately the perpetuation of our cultural heritage and indigenous identity. Although our region is considered one of the most remote, fiber optics and technology has created a global world village that can give voice to Micronesia's remarkable stories. From a global perspective, Micronesia as a region is not well known. In the international spotlights, we are known for the large migration into the US, to being victims of climate change and used as geopolitical pawns. Last year on Guampedia.com, we produced an historical timeline of Micronesian milestones, which you'll see behind me, um, which highlights our region's important historical events in the context of world events. This timeline is just a beginning of an effort to bring the history of our region, separated for so long by world forces, back together to give us a grasp of who we are as one and to reconnect our islands as the ancient sea lanes once did. In the Marianas, like Polynesia, we lost our seafaring traditions from canoe building, celestial navigations, and chants. It would have been lost forever. But fortunately, we live in a region where the ancient sacred realm of seafaring traditions have been protected, practiced, and held in trust. Master navigators that broke that sacred code, Mao Pielik, Manny Sakao, and others, have empowered efforts to revive these traditions and ensure they are preserved for the sake of our future generations. The world needs to be reminded of Micronesia's single hull sacred vessels and amazing traditional navigators. Long live the navigators. And so to begin our panel discussion, our master navigator is um, having served in the Federated States of Micronesia as a diplomat in international affairs. He's also served as a cultural advocate for the Remetau, or people of the, of the Central Carolines. Larry Rigatel is the co-founder of WAGE, a community-based organization that uses traditional skills to confront the social, economic, and environmental challenges faced by the people of Micronesia's most remote outer islands. He's also an accomplished master canoe carver and a worrying Po navigator. He also serves as an instructor for the UOG Sea Grant teaching courses on traditional navigation and climate change adaptation. And so now our first speaker, uh, Po Larry Regatel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rita, for the introduction. Uh, the 
the virtual conference. Uh, pay my respect to all of you who are joining us from wherever you may be. Uh, good morning to all of you, half a day from beautiful island of Dawn. Uh, I, I begin with uh, <clears throat> maybe <clears throat> a brief uh, explanation of the of the uh, chant uh, that we just did uh, previous to this, uh, where my uncle, uh, great uncle Vasquez uh, Mark, uh, is, is here to join me, uh, bestowing that, uh, giving me the permission to speak uh, on his behalf and on behalf of those who came before us from that lineage. Rita mentioned that uh, I, uh, Mark is from my mother's side lineage, uh, who is from Pulot. And so, uh, as some of you may know, uh, Pulot, uh, like Sarawal and all the other uh, outer islands have held on to uh, this traditional uh, indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge. Um, for Mark and myself, our ancestors uh, goes all the way back to their land that is known as Hafrush. And Hafrush is uh, underneath the ocean. At some point in time, uh, when our ancestors uh, saw the threat that they were seeing coming, this uh, when this current of change that was going to uh, change the uh, threaten their knowledge, they decided that the best way to hold on and keep that wisdom was to sink their island and go down uh, thousands of feet below the ocean. And somewhere along the way, some of them decided that they should go up and they carved their canoes out of coral heads that you could still see today on some of those islands. Uh, they voyaged across uh, the region and settled different places. Um, and for us uh, in Puluat, they settled uh, on the estate known as Habuila, uh, literally translating that to be half underneath the ocean. Uh, that is the origin of Mark and myself, where we have uh, come from. And it is essential that he bestow that uh, permission for me to speak on their behalf. Uh, and also the second chant that we did was to, we call it Sumetal, or at least two verses of it was done to open up the ceilings uh, and therefore open up our uh, meeting this morning. I'm grateful, of course, to the Jamoro people for giving us the permission to speak uh, here on the land of Guam. And, and I'm indebted to them for giving that opportunity to us. This morning, I want to just highlight a few things uh, with regards to uh, this sacred knowledge of navigation that has been um, uh, passed on. You know, the navigation as we know it encompasses a lot of uh, other sacred knowledge that are part of it. And I will be talking about some of them to become one of uh, those navigators, uh, you walk that, that line of ensuring that uh, all the knowledge that is required and essential for seafaring, you obtain them along the way. 
Uh, for this code, it is clear that uh, a navigator cannot be uh, a navigator had he not have a, a single hull canoe to take him out into the ocean. And that canoe would be rendered useless also if it cannot be sustained over time, therefore having a canoe hut to protect it. So we call them the Tamayrong or the fathers of, of sacred knowledge. And we um, identified about 10 of this uh, sacred knowledge that are uh, Tamayrong to us. Beginning, of course, we place them on a canoe. Uh, we will put them on the, uh, on the tam or on the ama or on the outrigger and float with those three who sit there, namely the, the sinap, the tauwam and the tauyan. They get to sit out on the float there. Uh, from the master canoe carver to the builder and to the thinker. We place on the main hull of our canoe the Taubwe uh, and Taubhuman and Palula. Uh, here we have the navigator, the uh, weatherman, and uh, fortune telling men are there. And finally, on the Epep or the extension side, we place. Taoerus, Taotafe, Taojeu, and the Hamod, or the chief, they sit there. This is the spiritual component of the voyage. <clears throat> so we have the medis herbal medicinal men, the masseuse, and the spirit men, all uh, have their own position. Point being that we have a uh, all-around uh, system that requires for us to learn along the way as we're growing into uh, becoming a seafarer. In the islands, the canoe house is our center of learning that allows for us to begin at a very young age uh, to learn from the elders before we start picking up the ads and start learning how to carve before we start uh, learning the voyaging uh, side of it <coughs> and so on and so forth um, but it, this knowledge that we have come to learn uh, and has been passed on to us for generations, also have some uh, important unspoken, if you like, uh, values that come along with them, including those that are of, in my opinion, relevant to us today. For example, I see that um, our islands are, you, you know, our islands are very small. Uh, these are atolls, nothing more than six feet above sea level. So my island of Lamatrek and Puluat are nothing more than just uh, uh, two miles in, in length and, and two square miles or and six feet above sea level. So um, as such, we have a close-knit community that allows for us to, to drive. Uh, and for us to do that, these values that are uh, being taught to us, aside from learning all those indigenous skills and knowledge, are those that, that teaches us how to respect uh, the elders. How do we um, respect the natural resources that we have? So for a canoe to be carved, we would have to cut some trees. And being small and limited on, on resource uh, to cut a, a breadfruit tree down, uh, it's, it's incumbent on master canoe carvers to ensure that they could use whatever it can be used 
that don't need to be cut down. So if a log has flowed over to the island, we have a canoe to build. Um, that's our gift from uh, the deity of uh, canoe, car canoe carving, and we have to make use of it. Uh, likewise, in the seafaring practice, uh, in voyaging, you're taught to always uh, respect the lead navigator or the ghost navigator, we call it, uh, Tom Eddy, because he's the leader. And even though you think that you may know the skills or the knowledge, uh, it ha it's incumbent on, uh, on the tr practice and value of, of traditional navigation that you follow the lead navigator all the time. And there's no questions asked of what he is capable of doing. I think these are great values that have been uh, uh, passed on for generations that allows for one of us, each one of us, to, to live in a society that adheres to these values because we all know that we're all also going to be growing into that someday. And those who are coming after us would benefit from it. <coughs> I think I want to share with you that uh, the idea of taking our island wisdoms, our theme, and applying it to global future uh, is to me something that our ancestors have been practicing for generations. And for some reason, I'm convinced that they knew uh, that there was going to be this big change coming and therefore keep their wisdom thousands of feet underneath uh, the ocean um, was something that uh, our ancestors were well aware of and passed on to us these values that we must sustain life on our small islands we have very limited resources now we're not just threatened by globalization in some ways but we are threatened by the impact of climate change that is happening uh, as we speak for some of our low-lying islands we have uh, frequent storms that may be contrary to what our knowledge is is showing us in the universe of the stars uh, and the currents and the ocean swells and everything else that our ancestors teach us. Uh, <clears throat> these storms out of nowhere, they come. We see the encroaching, fast encroaching shoreline um, with the saltwater intrusion into our taro patches that, that helps us sustain lives on these small islands. Uh, that is something that we are now being faced with. And I know that as much as we are doing our part to sustain, I also know that we don't contribute any of the factors that may cause the climate change issues and all, the, all that needs to come with it. So if there is one thing that I'm hoping that we could pass on to this conference and to people outside. It is that sustainability is an ancient wisdom. Sustainability has been uh, with us for thousands of years on these islands. Uh, we practice it. We pass it on to our younger ones uh, because it is our survival, it is our future that we pride ourselves in um, and make sure that they inherit these lands and the resources, the same that we did from our ancestors, if not better. Uh, and as uh, we see today, things have kind of changed drastically, including COVID-19 that is changing a lot of things for us. Uh, let's all come back down to earth 
and if need be, go underneath the ocean some distance down to to realize that we are all interdependent of each other, uh, and most especially on our resources. I know that uh, my colleagues would also uh, speak later on, speak to this issue of climate change and and by the way that uh, uh, protection chant that we did also extends <coughs> to colleagues in Hawaii, in, in Hawaii and to Vince out in Minnesota. So again, I thank you for the opportunity to be with you this morning. And may I now turn the mic back to uh, our moderator, Rita. Cesar Larry, and um, yes, um, these are small islands have really um, maintain a lot of these um, vital traditions, um, but they're also um, they're more susceptible to the challenges, especially climate change. And so these lessons of the ancient knowledge of interconnectedness um, really resonates um, the kind of attitude that we all need to take move forward in terms of collaboration and unity um, to navigate these challenges. Um, and so with that, our next navigator uh, is an interdisciplinary scholar uh, in history, anthropology, cultural studies, comparative and global indigenous studies, and who specializes in critical indigenous studies in North America and the Pacific Ocean region. Dr. Vince Diaz, raised on Guam with Ponapean and Filipino lineage, researched and published in topics as, as such as indigenous critical theory, traditional outrigger canoe voyaging in Micronesia, and trans-indigenous theory and practice. He's the director of the Native Canoe Program in the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, where he conducts community-based research and learning in indigenous canoe culture and knowledge in ways that partner disparate indigenous communities work in cultural and political resurgence with innovative relationships across humanities, social science, and STEM research. His most recent project on trans-indigenous knowledge, politics and relations, also involves virtual and augmented reality development. Let's welcome our next navigator, Dr. Vince Diaz. Thank you, um, Rita. A buenas and half a day to, uh, gosh, it looks like over a hundred people. I was looking at the gallery and I see family from old colleagues from all over the place. And so it's really exciting to see you. <clears throat> I was especially excited to see Larry uh, and uh, an old friend, Mark Pascas, opened this at the Ut in uh, Hagatnya. For those of you who don't know, um, when I was at the University of Guam in the 1990s, from 92 to 2001, um, we were able to start um, a canoe program and working with men mostly from Polowat Atoll and one of the first projects was to build that oot there, that canoe house. And we we needed a, a name for it that captured uh, what it was that we were trying to do. And the name, a lot of people don't know. And I'm not sure if it's still used there because um, as it should, that canoe house has undergone a lot of changes and a lot of, um, um, evolution. But the name that we chose was uh, Sazantasi Fachamon. And of course, in Chamorro, Sazantasi is translates to something like the sea as and and as meeting place. And uh, in Carolinian Fachamon or in the Central Carolines, uh, Fachamon is like uh, old spirits. And so it, it, we wanted to reflect this uh, moment of coming together between uh, Chamorros and uh, non-Chamorros like myself from Guam uh, who wanted to 
work in the revitalization of uh, canoe culture. And in many respects, my what I was especially proud of and what continues to inform the work I do here with uh, Dakota and other Pacific Islander communities, even if I'm in American Indian studies, was shaped and, and it continues to be informed by the work that we we're doing there. Um, this would feature how higher learning has to be engaged in the place where uh, it's located, and specifically the indigenous people. There's also um, the power of cultural traditions, not just in and the, their own right as the, er, the birthright of the people who own it, but also its power to help us rethink narratives about who we are, about how the past is understood, about how politics and issues of power are understood. And so it was from the work around canoes in particular that I continue to look to um, what I always see as, as a homegrown tradition um, that has legs, that has the capacity to, um, to not only serve us uh, who have rights and connections to, to it, but for everybody in this idea that a canoe and it's the culture and where it comes from has that caring capacity. And so what I wanted to do is um, share with you some of the ideas as they've unfolded over the last 20 years, as I've been working in the context of American Indian studies in the Midwest, but always with uh, the American Indian communities first at, in Michigan, this would be Anishinaabe, Ojibwe folks, uh, but also in Illinois and now at the University of Minnesota uh, where Tina and I are located. And uh, I'm going to switch to a, a slide Can you guys see that? Can I get some kind of thumbs up? Okay, good. So the Pioneer Public TV in Minnesota recently did a, I thought a really excellent um, episode on a project that we've launched uh, last year that brought Mario Benito, uh, a Polowat navigator who was actually ordained in the post ceremony with Larry at the 2016 uh, FESPAC. A lot of you will remember that. And Mario is someone I've worked with for almost 30 years now from Polowat. We brought him out and he worked with a community of Chukis in a town called Milan here to build this canoe that you see. And, um, and two additional features of the project was that the working on the canoe also involved um, Dakota community members who are also interested in revitalizing their canoe traditions and their traditional ecological knowledge around water, land, skies, and things like that. And so this was a, 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 um, a collaboration with the, the Chukis and the American Indian communities specifically the upper and lower Sioux people. But there was also a collaborative with STEM researchers, especially in the School of Design and Engineering. Um, and the, we're not able to show the video for technical reasons, but um, the first, the opening of this, and I invite you to check, just Google Pioneer uh, Public TV season 11, episode three, and it's just called Canoe Project. But it's like a 12 minute long, I think, excellent thing that uh, about this relationship. And it just came out a few months ago. Uh, and uh, it opens with, with uh, the launching of the canoe and my voice saying, we shouldn't be surprised to find 
a Micronesian canoe in a lake in the middle of the plains in Minnesota because we have deep in our cultural and historical DNA movement in our blood. And what I wanted to do today was present material on two registers. One, the kind of an abstract language, what I might call the wisdoms that I've learned from seafaring over the last 30 years, the things that I think are profound truths that have a lot to teach us. And I'll explain why. But the second register, I want to show images from three projects that we're doing uh, through the Native Canoe Program with the communities. So let me go ahead and get that, begin there. The first point, this wisdom is this. Canoe culture teaches us how to be a real human through relations of kinship and reciprocity with other than human beings. And the other than human beings include the elements of land, water, and sky forms. The second wisdom that I take away from seafaring culture is how these relations, these relations of kinship and reciprocity, how they're forged through millennial disciplined and artful study. And the study involves observation, but also other multi-sensory and deeply embodied engagement. So it's not just observation, it's not just the visual, it's fully embodied. And it, it involves this disciplined and artful relation with these other than human natural and even supernatural forms of beings. So these kinship and reciprocity relations are also relations of knowledge. So the third point is how these relations have evolved into powerful and compelling cultural ways of being. Philosophers call this ontology, the status and the conditions of what it means to exist as a person or as a people. But they've also evolved ways of knowing or epistemologies, traditions of knowledge, systems of knowledge. And these relations are also moral and ethical systems. So there's notions of what's right and what's wrong and how one should live. So these are three biggies for me. A couple others. Seafaring culture teaches us a lot about place, roots, and depth. And these are all interrelated. For example, the importance of place, especially for native people, is as the site or the location where the connection runs deep. You might think of it as vertical, going downwards, deep in time. So the time honored cultural substance. So the depth is also substantive. It's heavy, it's laden with deep meaning. So place is associated with depth in substance and in wisdom. And it's picked up by the idea of roots in the same way that roots can go down deep. And roots are who we are and they're stable. Now roots in terms of depth also gives us the notion of time, as in long time ago, deep time. 
The deep time of Australian Aboriginal history runs back to 60, 70,000 years at least. 60, 70,000 years. But the depth is also substance. So we might say, for example, that place matters for natives. And that's a kind of truism. Almost everybody recognizes that. They acknowledge it. And in fact, it's been so associated with nativeness for good, but also in some pretty bad ways. And I'll return to that in a while. But one of the things that comes out of the, the importance of place, roots, and depth is the importance of knowing one's proper place. That's a big one in native studies and in native politics. It was transformative for me as a young scholar to realize my place as a non-chamorro, on chamorro homelands. But seafaring also teaches us about travel, mobility, roots, and reach. The importance of travel or mobility and the technologies and capacities that enable successful travel. Here's where you're going to start seeing the truths of seafaring culture. And I like to call this routes. So routes and routes. Routes in terms of reach, reach as in distance traveled in geographic or oceanic census, but also in terms of traveling across time, traveling across cultures, crossing other categories even crossing material forms, shape-shifting, American Indians call it, Christianity or Catholicism calls it transubstantiation, existing in multiple forms simultaneously. Unlike roots, travel and mobility have not been seen as essential features of nativeness. If anything, these have been seen as the essential, as the monopoly of the West or modernity, travel, mobility, good and bad, progress or imperialism, but it's also always been associated with innovation and progress. The effect is to, to have it dissociated from nativeness and to only think of nativeness in terms of roots. It's, the effect is, I think, the sequestering of natives and things native in time and place, disassociating us and our traditions from notions of progress, innovation, advancement, science. Seafaring returns that, forces us to put roots and routes together, to see these as not mutually exclusive, but mutually generative. Seafaring returns that important element alongside roots. Two other points. The beautiful thing about being from the uh, in Micronesia is we're close by and we know uh, one of the powerful things about the Central Carolines. It's where this ancient tradition continued unabated through centuries of colonial rule. It was from that story of survival that a remarkable story of revival emerged beginning in the 1970s across all of Oceania. The story of survival and revival of seafaring is a powerful one-two punch. The takeaway, canoe culture in survival and revival modes furnishes the wisdom of roots and routes of depth and reach for rethinking nativeness, for rethinking the relationship between the past, present, and future, between the local and the global. Larry started us from the bottom of the sea, but definitions of, of islands reach up to the stars and include the indigenous creatures and how far they've traveled. This propels us not only forward, but it gives us a homegrown indigenous system for theorizing and putting it into practice. You all know the Pacific. 
most people don't realize how big it is. Just our part of Micronesia alone is almost lar as large as the continental United States from Palau to the Marshalls. If you include Kiribati, we go almost double the size. That's just Micronesia. This is the map of Austronesian canoes, outrigger canoes, technology, and Austronesian based languages. Check out this map. I hope you can locate yourself in it. Austronesian speaking outrigger sailing people beginning three to 5,000 years ago started to fan out. This area of the world is almost two thirds of the globe's watery surface. This is our local global. What we have in the Central Carolines is the survival of what made this happen. Part of my mission is to take it further. This is our oot, <laughs> our canoe house in Minnesota. Minnesota is Minnesota Makoche, homelands of Dakota people. Dakota, Lakota, better known, or also known as Sioux. They were removed from the state. Less than 1% of the population of Dakota live in either the cities or four communities, the upper, the lower Sioux, upper lower of the Minnesota River, Prairie Island Sioux, and the Shakopee Sioux. 99% of the Dakota people are in exile. Since 1862, they live around here, the, the, the surrounding states, all the way up to Canada. At the heart of Sioux country, between the upper Sioux and lower Sioux, is a community now known as the Milanesians, a Chukis community in the town of Milan. Almost 300. They are almost two thirds of the town's population. And what's remarkable <laughs> is that almost all of them are from one island in the Chuk Lagoon, Romanum, or Unanu. There's Romanum Island in the bottom, its location in the Chuk Lagoon. We superimpose the Chuk Lagoon on Minnesota Makochi and locate Romanum in it. This is a powerful map. It allows the Chukis to see where they are in relation to the map that they're familiar with. This is a really powerful graphic that links Micronesia and Chuk and Romanum to Dakota homelands. It's part of the project we're doing with the School of Design. The immediate goal was what, what would it, if we were to design a Micronesian canoe on Dakota homelands, what would it look like? How can we design a Micronesian oot that knows it's on Dakota waters, lands, and skies. That became the basis for community relations. This is one of the projects Back to Indigenous Futures. It involved building that canoe that I mentioned at the outset, but also Mario and the guys working with the Dakota to build a wata. This is the second water to have been built for the, by Sioux, by the Upper Sioux, the Lower Sioux rather, since the 1860s. And I'm proud that it was done with Micronesians working with them. Here's the wa, that's mine, and the wata. And we do a lot of 
paddling on the rivers. And of course, we carry the flags, Lower Sioux, the FSM Sioux, the Guam flag. The projects are also virtual. Augmented reality. We can augment reality with 3D pop-ups that can be animated with the right viewing devices, your laptop or your, or your uh, pad or your phone. We've also developed the beginnings of a pretty me, decent Jones. voyaging simulation. Excuse and me, I Dr. can't show Jones. the videos here, but uh, I, I noticed Mimi George was in the audience here. Mimi's in the middle there. Mimi, of course, works with uh, folks in Tamako uh, voyaging, and she came up and visited us. In the middle, you'll see uh, the um, you put on the goggles and you're on a wa in the Chuk Lagoon to actual data of the rising and setting stars. We can take a simulated voyage. We can learn how the stars rise and set. But we took it a step further and you can actually steer the canoe and pull the sail in and move forward. So it's also uh, uh, multi-sensory in that way and not just visual. This is just the start. <laughs> We hope to be working with Mimi George, whose work also deals with wave navigation in Taumako. And uh, we hope to begin to simulate some of that stuff. I'm gonna close very, very quickly with um, what we're doing with PAFU. PAFU is, is simply put, it's a way of teaching how, what stars are used for directional purposes. The rising and setting points in the eastern horizon and the western horizon are marked by shells. The shells represent stars, specific constellations, rising and setting. This is, this is what kids learn to begin to learn the stars. But once we put this in, in a virtual reality, we can actually immerse ourselves in these stars, in this, in this mat and shells the shells can begin to rise and then they can turn into the stars. We can start in Milan, watch the shells begin to rise and then they turn into the constellations. We can point our canoe from Milan in the plains of Minnesota to where the appropriate stars are to where Chuk is. And we can begin to voyage from Milan to Chuk. I hope that this will have given you a little bit of um, what it is that our traditions can do, where it can take us. Thank you. Um, but Sizo Smasi again, Dr. Vince, um, there's just, again, uh, uh, so much inspiration that we can draw on, uh, particularly with these projects um, from the ancient wisdom. Um, through sea, uh, traditional seafaring and voyaging. And um, our next speaker, again, we send our prayers to Nainoa Thompson and his family, who was unable to join us at the last minute, but his faithful crew member uh, is, a, is a navigator and the voyaging director of Polynesian Voyaging Society. Lehua Kamalu supports the ongoing voyages of the double-hulled canoes Hukalea and Hikianalia. I'm sorry. She started volunteering with PVS in 2009 while attending the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Lehua graduated with a BS in mechanical engineering in 2013 when she decided to join the Polynesian Voyaging Society uh, full time, uh, responsible for researching and planning the sail plan for Hukalea's circumnavigation of the Earth between 2014 and 2018, a voyage that was themed Malama Honoa to care for the Earth. 
Her focus has now been to explore and develop methods of sharing and teaching in the hope that this work will create a generation of voyagers to carry on the values and traditions of voyaging and lead Hawaii into a healthy, thriving future. She's able to do this as an instructor of voyaging and navigation to students from Kamehameha Schools and Honolulu Community College. Welcome, Lehua. Aloha, Rita. Mahalo. Uh, that was a wonderful introduction and makes it sound really awesome. Um, I guess, uh, firstly, yes, aloha my kako to everyone who's joining from across the Pacific and around the world. Um, I'm very humbled and honored to be here in this virtual space um, alongside Vince and with uh, Larry and Mark. I want to thank you for that beautiful blessing at the start of this session to really um, establish this space and set the tone for the conversation um, because these these things truly are um, sacred, this ancient wisdom. And I know Nainua oftentimes will use the word magic, um, but uh, I know that that encompasses sacred in how we describe these things. Uh, and again, Kalamai, we apologize. He wasn't able to be here. Uh, even I was looking forward to <laughs> watching this conversation between the three of you and certainly was surprised to be on the panel itself. Um, I will try to honor the spirit of his message, um, but I'm certain I will fall short of it. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there and a big thank you and uh, recognizing um, each of you for for allowing me to be here and share a little bit about maybe a perspective from a, another generation, I suppose. Uh, Naidoa sometimes refers to us as the younger generation and then equally reminds us that we are already old. Uh, and for those who um, may not know this relationship between Hawaii and Guam and Micronesia and the many islands, uh, really was forged long ago. Um, we always uh, bring honor to Mao for connecting us all those years ago uh, when Kokolea was constructed and went on her very first voyage in 1976. And um, that gift he gave of teaching and that gift of navigation is something that has continued to give for years and years and we are now you know in the second and third generation of learning and always trying to remember as much as we can knowing we never get to meet some of these people we never get to see them but certainly their words and their lessons are embodied in this wisdom that we hope to carry on so we'll, we'll try to do that honor and um as 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 much as we can uh Rita had uh, mentioned that uh, I'm the voyaging director at Polynesian Voyaging Society here in Hawaii, and we um, have two uh, double hulled uh, canoes that were constructed at different times. But part of my work is uh, dually envisioning what voyaging looks like in the future, especially, of course, here in Hawaii, but also uh, alongside many of our. Voyagers in the Pacific um, and ensuring that we do remember the stories and the history and the teachers that really allowed us to do all of this and have brought us to this point. Um, gosh, there's, <laughs> I, I was listening so closely, Larry, to you and Vince that I forgot that I had to talk at the end and uh, <laughs> probably will eventually find my way to something that hopefully uh, is, is helpful. Um, Maybe to touch on what Rita had mentioned, we recently returned from a circumnavigation around the world that would not have been possible without uh, all of these gifts we were given. And we worked to really ensure that the intensity and the power of navigation could hopefully be shared into another generation and we continue to work on that to this day as we think about what our next voyage looks like the number one or one of the one of the first things that comes to mind is how do we address the leadership of these canoes um there you mentioned you know we, we never question the navigator's decision and what they do and that is a huge responsibility for that person um, and 
I guess a nice way I like to think about uh, the, the role of a navigator and their purpose. Um, I've heard that, you know, you, you are the light, you are meant to shine things. And I also think of it as someone who is there to protect life. You are there, you are the one who is going to make the decisions that affect everyone on your canoe. And you are going to make sure that we have the resources and we have the plan to get through, you know, whatever we may be sailing through. And these lessons have not just stayed out at sea. They have certainly come onto land and found a home in many places. Uh, when we sailed around the world, our message was ma la mahonua. It is um, a Hawaiian phrase that simply means to care for the earth. And it's, uh, again, it, it, it's so simple and, and can have so many different ways of being interpreted by different communities that have different needs and different uh, situations. Um, and it's something that has carried forward and I find myself saying it all the time and it's great because now even other people in the community will come up and say, yeah, malama honua, everybody, if they're like telling someone to like pick up trash off the ground. And so it's, it's really great to see that. Um, I guess I do want to, I, I briefly scrolled through uh, the participants and I saw some wonderful friends and colleagues who were part of that voyage around the world and allowed it to happen. Uh, you mentioned Mimi George, Vince, and uh, Mimi Hai um, was also able to join us on many legs of that voyage and uh, bring all of that wonderful work that she continues to do with uh, Tom Muckle. Um, I saw Celeste and Kate there as well, who additionally were able to help us understand how the lessons we learn on voyages and on our canoes could be impactful in places we don't necessarily have all of the expertise. Um, they were a wonderful uh, source of guiding us through uh, the United Nations and the events we did with them and also creating the um, Hawaii Green Growth, which has done a lot of work to uh, bring sustainability to the forefront here in Hawaii and hopefully we will continue to build on that over the coming years. Um, gosh, I have <laughs> so many thoughts, but um, yeah, maybe back to my work in, in how we protect and how we perpetuate this gift that was given to us um, through the voyage, there were a number of us uh, young, young folks, uh, young at the time maybe, who were able to learn some, uh, some of the elements of navigation uh, from Nainoa and from Bruce and uh, some of the navigators who were lucky to sail with. Um, by no means are we any sort of masters. We are, we are preschoolers. Nainoa says he's in kindergarten and we are certainly uh, whatever it comes before kindergarten, <laughs> um, in just beginning to understand how to learn about the world around us and this earth and the life systems that make sure that we can live healthy lives. And uh, what we've done with that is try to, try to, I don't want to use the word scale, I don't really like that word, but um, try to understand how we can reach more of our young people who don't get that opportunity to sail out on the open ocean with us. It's a very challenging thing to do. It takes many years of training. And so my work has been focused in on some of our, our younger folks who are certainly really passionate voices in our community. They may still be in high school or at the university level um, to help train them in a little bit of getting in the water and challenging some of their uh, fears about uh, the ocean space that they live in and also understanding some of those lessons. So that has been a real uh, blessing for me to be able to learn as I get to teach. Um, gosh. Uh, for my own personal experience in voyaging, I, I started in 2009 to just begin to learn voyaging and sailing and training with Nainoa. And that was the beginning of getting ready for the circumnavigation and I had no idea what I was doing and certainly in that journey I have come to understand the you know the priceless uh, parts of this world that allow me to navigate. I, I tend to focus on birds a lot when I talk about uh, sustainability and, and the conservation 
because I think about the times that we are nearing an island on a canoe and we've been at sea for two to three weeks at a time. And uh, I like to think, you know, at that point, we're not navigating, we're simply looking for nature's navigators sometimes. Um, and I think about the seabirds and the ones that nest on the island and come out and show us where to go. And they're the ones that are really guiding us. And so really it's, it's not necessarily my job to know where to go. It's my job to make sure that those birds are still around and they still have little nesting holes in the cliffs and that their, their environments are protected so that they can continue to allow us uh, to find these islands. And so I guess that's one area that I like to think has really made me think about, you know, the birds and the fish and the weather systems that have been so consistent for so many generations and centuries for uh, all of the seafarers in the Pacific to find these small islands and how now seems to be a time that those things maybe aren't, aren't as consistent. You know, each year you say, oh, this, you always say like, oh, it's never like this, or it's never been this, this stormy during this time of the year, or it's never been this windy, or, you know, the tides have never been this high. And looking back on those generations of, of wisdom and observance and carefully tracking what goes on really allows you to see very, in a very raw manner what, what's happening out there. And you have an emotional connection to it because you realize that this is the ocean and the land that sustains you and these small changes are not are not insignificant it's not like oh you know i'm sure it's just today but you notice that the next day and then the next year um oh boy maybe something that i i hope is Additionally, what, what Nainoa would have wanted to bring to this conversation is the deep respect and aloha that this community in Hawaii has for our brothers and sisters in Guam and in Lama Trek and in Sadawal and in the many islands of Micronesia who in many ways we envy you because, or should I say we're inspired by your your community and your ability to stay so tight knit and um, in a way that sometimes we can get a little lost in the, the, the city world of Honolulu, I'll call it. Uh, it can be very urban and you can feel sometimes disconnected from those who might have the same ideas or share the same vision for what these islands should look like and perhaps should re return to. Uh, and so that's always an inspiration to see such a clarity of vision um, that I know we need. and. Again, I'm, I, I apologize and I know I wasn't able to join us and I know he looks forward to your next conversation again, uh, Vince and Larry. Um, but maybe with that, I'll just say mahalo nui and uh, look forward to your questions. And you did bring honor to Nainoa and your organization um, by speaking so eloquently and to the heart about what inspires you about voyaging and the importance it is, especially to a new generation, our future generation of Pacific voyagers, um, that we can root in ourselves in the ancient traditions of navigation that has been kept in trust in the smallest and most remote island of Micronesia and with their willingness to share it with us and to use it as a cultural framework, as a way to chart our destiny into this new emerging reality, um, and that it would be charted towards sustainability. Now, we do not have time for um, discussions, but I urge all of you to please stay tuned into our virtual networking session after the conference is um, um, concluded. And so I'd like to call, um, introduce uh, Kara Flores, who is the founder and director of Duk Duk Goose, a Guahan nonprofit that aims to equip the next generation of protectors through indigenous, indigenous media that affirms indigenous identity and amplifies indigenous voices, stories, and knowledge for Guahan and across Micronesia. 
Flores has worked with cultural-based media for over 10 years and is part of the Obama Foundation's 2019 Asia-Pacific Leaders Program. In addition, she was our virtual reception moderator for last week's session. Welcome, Kara. Thank you, Rita. Last year, the university, or I'm sorry, in 2018, the University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability partnered with Larry Rigatol to offer a college course on traditional navigation and climate change adaptation. For the past few months, in a partnership with CIS, our small team has had the privilege to spend time with Larry to assist in the shift of this course to a virtual platform in response to COVID-19. As an indigenous production company committed to empowering the next generation of protectors by affirming identity, uplifting traditional knowledge, and amplifying indigenous voices, it was an honor to partner with CIS and to spend this time with Larry. As we listened to his lessons on navigation, the ocean, our islands, and our obligations to the ancestors and to our grandchildren, we were reminded of the words of Pacific poet, Teresia Teawiwa. We sweat and cry salt water, so we know that the ocean is really in our blood. We can trust these ocean origins that traditional navigators know so well to guide us into a global future of true sustainability. Enjoy this video clip. You know, the spiritual aspect of who we are, of as natives, as people of these islands, is, is, is humbling in a lot of ways. We are all interdependent of each other and more so dependent on the resource that we have. There is also a lot of important lessons being taught in seafaring, lessons in life that teaches you how, how do you treat living things. So the respect that is necessary for you to understand that is respecting the elders, understanding your role within that society. Uh, it all evolves around seafaring. But all these practices is, is in a way sustainable because it allows you to change around your methods from ocean to land. You know, if we can just begin to appreciate uh, the resources that are around us and understand that it's important for our own survival and maybe survival of the human race. Uh, I think island wisdom can teach the world. A lot has changed and a lot is happening. But I think if we weed all of that out and start to come back, basic understanding of us living interdependently of each other and dependent on the resource that we have, therefore we must take care of it. So that tomorrow's generation can be uh, assured some security of their own life. And as I said, seafaring encompasses a whole lot of things that, that is not just a practice of sailing a canoe uh, into the ocean, but all that comes with it. If we lose it, oh, I think that uh, we would lose a lot of who we are we lose a lot of that value, cultural value, that allows for a small community to survive, to live together, and able, being able to sustain that livelihood over time. Some island communities have been fortunate to have never lost their connection to their traditional knowledge, and some of us are reconnecting with that knowledge now. As islanders continue to be guided by traditional wisdom and methods of knowing to chart the way forward during these challenging times, we can anticipate that the world may look to us for solution for a sustainable future. Island wisdom is more relevant than ever. Before we end, I'll ask you two poll questions. First question, how much do you agree with the following statement? Traditional island knowledge is important to our global future and you can answer on the scale of from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And I'll give you a few seconds to answer. So this um, includes traditional seafaring, but it could also include ways of agriculture or other ways of knowing traditional medicine. 
anything that's considered traditional knowledge. Okay, I'll give you two to three more seconds to answer. Okay, ready? Ending poll, and I'll share the results with you. Okay, so it looks like most people uh, here with us today on Zoom strongly agree that traditional island knowledge is important to our global future. So I hope today has inspired you um, with some ideas about um, going forward to the future with some solutions. Which brings us to our second question. How many new lessons or ideas do you have after listening to today's session? There was a lot that was discussed and covered. Um, we heard a whole history of our seafaring uh, history. We heard ways that we're incorporating it into our present. Um, so what are your thoughts and new lessons or ideas from today? Feel free to type them into the chat if you've already answered the poll. And I'll give you guys five more seconds to answer the poll. Okay, ready? I'm gonna show you the results. Great, it looks like most people have at least one or two ideas and that's plenty for um, starting something new. And maybe they weren't ideas, maybe there are lessons and that's still very valuable to um, bringing this knowledge into the present and continuing it into the future. All right, thank you so much for answering those poll questions. And thank you all for attending week five of the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability. And thanks again to our partners and sponsors for helping make this virtual conference series possible. Just as we opened with a traditional blessing, it is fitting that we close this week's program with the traditional way with the Kulu. After that, we'll transition to our 30 minute virtual networking reception with Obama leaders from CNMI, Representative Sheila Babauta and Sammy Birmingham Babauta. And if you can't make it, we hope to see you at our next program, Women Business Leaders Sustainability Solutionaries, curated and moderated by Amanda Ellis, the Director of Global Partnerships at the Global Futures Lab and the Hawaii and Asia Pacific Executive Director for the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability at Arizona State University. This program will be next Friday, Guam time from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. and Thursday if you're across the date line. Suzuas Maasi and have a great day. Biba Island Sustainability and Biba UOG. My name is Sammy Birmingham Babalta, and I am with the Nutrition and Education Program at the Northern Marianas College, Cooperative Research Extension, and Education Services. And I work to improve community health. I am one of two of the CDMI Obama future leaders, and I'm so happy to be here and connect with you all. Afade and Casalelia. My name is Sheila Jack Babata, and I serve as the representative for Precinct 4 in the 21st CNMI House of Representatives. I was born and raised here on the beautiful island of Saipan, and I'm excited to be a part of the Obama Asia Pacific Leaders Program and so honored to share this time with you. 
will be your moderators for today's virtual networking session. And we're excited for a rich discussion with you all on how to navigate our islands today using the Asian winds of the past, winds that have blessed us with great souls, sails, or challenged us with typhoons, but have always carried us through. So permission was mentioned as an important first step when navigating. And we are grateful to be granted permission to share this space with one another, just like how we are connected by the ocean. Technology has given us a chance to connect during these times of COVID-19. And that is the purpose of this networking reception. We hope to create the safe and fun space for us to share, learn, and support one another. All right, so here is how this is going to work. Um, in a few minutes, we're going to open up the floor to all of you. But first, join us in turning on your camera for this virtual coffee hour or happy hour, depending on where you are. Show us your coffee cups, <laughs> hopefully sustainable cups. Um, and you know, feel free to use the chat box and share with all of us. Yes, so please turn on your cameras so we can see your beautiful faces from all over the world. So we ask that you please keep your comments to under a minute or two so that we can hear from as many people as possible. And so first we are going to start off with a couple of interactive questions that everyone can do at once uh, by using the chat box and also the video. All right, you'll answer these questions by um, giving us different hand gestures that we'll show you. Um, or typing your answers in the chat box. So let's get started. For the first one, we want you to give us an ASL clap like this. If the protector chat this morning made you feel grounded, made you feel warm, made you smile, so show us your ASL clap if that's how it made you feel. <gasps> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My child. <laughs> All right. For the next one, we want you to give us a Napu wave, so like this, to the camera, if you've sailed on an indigenous canoe. And please use the chat box to type in the name of your canoe, uh, the canoe that you sailed on. I love those waves. Can we do that one more time? Because they're so fun. So you want to see everybody do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So show us your sales like this. If your organization or place of work works towards the survival or revival of our island traditions. Awesome, and we're getting in names of the canoes that people have sailed on. Uh, we have Chelu, Neni, Richard Semen, and Anagwen from 500 Sails, Lometu, Maisu. Oh, thank you all for sharing. Saina, The Quest, Fanagazen, Solo. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Yes, beautiful. I love that we've sailed on so many canoes. And for the last one in the chat box, we'd like you to type one word or one sentence takeaway from today's session. <laughs> one word or takeaway from today's session, Biba. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> nice, inspiring. Onwards. Connected possibilities. I like that one. Survival to revival. That was one of my favorites. Roots and routes. I love that one too. Nice. Thank you all for sharing. Great. Awesome, so now we wanna hear from you um, and you can let us know that you wanna speak by raising your hand virtually on Zoom 
can see the button below. And then we'll call on you um, or unmute you to share with the group. Before you, you speak, please start by saying your name, where you're from, and about the work that you're doing to create a more sustainable future. Uh, help us give time for everybody to share by keeping your comments under a minute um, so we can all hear, hopefully from everybody. Oh, here we have uh, Mr. Lawrence Cunningham who is waving and would like to share some words. So rejoice, my brothers and sisters. Our hearts shall never fail, so long as the bold Pacific Wayfinders are still hoisting sail. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham, for sharing. I um, just wanted to share that when I returned home after being away for 10 years, I was given the opportunity to sail uh, for the first time in my whole life with 500 sails. And so we do see them here with us today, uh, Emma and Pete Perez. They are doing phenomenal work here in the CNMI, reviving the seafaring culture and educating our community. Uh, Emma and Pete, thank you for being with us today. I'd like to give you the floor to please share with everyone um, the fantastic work that you're doing um, and how we can support you. There we go. Yes. Afade from Saipan. Um, I'm going to jump in. So all of you who are not from Saipan, please come to Saipan. We have three Chamorro Sackmen on the water. And we have five in the boatyard, including Tetlu, that was that recently joined our fleet from Guam. Uh, thank, thanks to uh, Mario, Mario Borja. Anyway, so we have, we have canoes, we have a sailing program, we have a swimming program. I wanted to comment. Sammy had asked us to do this if we were inspired or. Um, felt grounded or happy. I actually had to hold back tears during many of the presentations. Um, uh, Vince Diaz, when he mentioned how routes, the concept of routes and how they were taken away from us. And I hadn't even ever thought of that before. Of course, we were indigenous people traveled and that was taken away. And we're really focused on rebuilding the news and understanding our past. But the fact that we lost that ability, I find really sad because um, I had never really looked at it that way. Um, so I just wanted to share that and thank you. And it's great to see. Hi, Larry. When are you coming to Saipan? <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, oh, and also Dr. Underwood, it's so great to see your face on screen. Uh, seeing you in person at my father's house in Fremont decades ago was one of my favorite moments. Okay, now Pete. Okay, so mine's a little different. Uh, I just want to go right to what I hope to uh, share. Um, and that is that this, this process of revival is a huge, huge endeavor. And, and the way we do that here, we're focused on the boats. But we also need to look at the bigger picture. And, and I think the bigger picture that we all should keep in mind um, means that we have to have a lot of things in place for this to happen. And, and for cultural survival, we need to take care of, of our environment and our, you know, our community. Um, without, those, without the care of our environment, our community, it doesn't matter how many canoes we build, because we'll still be scattered to the wind. So what I'm focusing on, and I think I just want to share, and hopefully maybe some people will, will, can add to that, or maybe they can do some of these things, is my number one focus outside of building canoes is resisting the military. And the reason for that is I, I support the military as, as our, you know, community, our, our family. At the same time, we can't let them destroy our islands because we won't have islands. And we can't let them dominate our oceans or we can't travel between our oceans. That, to me, is the number one threat to the Chamorro Carolinian community of all Oceania is the domination and militarization of our islands because it's destructive uh, and you know, intrusive. The next one is we need to deal with the snakes on Guam. And I used to work for Fish and Wildlife, 
the snakes have have been uh, they're destroying our forests, which means our trees and our environment, and the consequences are huge. Um, and what we need to do is recognize that although we have snake programs, the snake programs are not killing snakes; they're studying snakes. And we need to put pressure on our community to start killing the damn snakes. Because if you can kill uh, enough half of the snakes, which is very very doable, even seventy five percent of the snakes, it'll take pressure off the environment, and we can have other we can have revival of the birds and the trees. And then the last one is what we can all do on every island throughout Micronesia is plant trees. And I want to talk to uh, local people here. Uh, maybe Sheila, we can have a discussion about this. I'd like to see if we can get some funding to plant three trees for everyone who has private property around their house. Three trees. One should be trunken lemai because that's what we eat. That's where we get our canoe wood from. Also bananas, <laughs> there's so many kinds of trees. But that will help us with food security, keep our, you know, our, our community safe and provide what we need to build the wooden canoes. Okay, that's more than a minute, I hope not. But okay, done. I wanna jump back in for one other thing that just a thought, we've been trying to revive maritime culture here. And this goes back to what Larry was saying that how important respect is. And one of the things that we've learned as, especially as we've gone into our sailing program is we, we were focusing on the technical aspects of sailing, but one of the problems that we ran into was the concept of respect and that somebody is the leader. And I think there's one of the, the things about westernization and colonization and democracy is that everyone seems to feel that they have to put in their two cents about whatever process we're doing. And in the end, we realized that we needed to teach people how to listen to the captain and not argue with the captain and know that the captain was um, trying to teach them or the navigator. The other thing, and that, and that we're still learning our place in this whole process. And we're very, very cognizant of how much we owe to um, the Carolinian navigators that have been helping us. And the other thing I wanted to share is that one of the things that we've learned through this process is if it's going to work, we have to work with the youth, not the adults. The adults want to, to they understand and they're passionate, but if it's going to grow and it's going to stick, we have to get to the youth. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Thank you. Okay. We're done. Oh, great. Thank you for sharing. And I totally agree with all of your great ideas. Thank you for starting with the youth. Uh, you know that you're always welcome at the Tanafe Youth Center uh, to teach our kids more about uh, seafaring activities. And the trees idea, we can definitely talk about that. <laughs> That'd be great. Yes, thank you so much. I've had the privilege of sailing with 500 sails. I made uh, two trips to Tinian on a Chamorro Sackman, so that was, you know, such a beautiful experience. So we'd also like to hear from Miss Victoria Blastov from Casa. Is she on? Let's see. I see her trying to. Okay. All right, me. there you go. Beautiful necklace. Thank you. I didn't have a question though. <laughs> But I like to say Biba. <laughs> <laughs> Hope everyone's fine and uh, surviving this uh, coronavirus. But uh, otherwise, I, um, I'm definitely connected with Larry Regatal. Uh, he's always helping us. He's very kind and generous to share his knowledge. And we definitely appreciate him. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do see that uh, Roberta Guerrero from MENA is on. Roberta Guerrero is the executive director for a nonprofit here um, in the CNMI, and they have had a program um, with planting trees all over our island. Uh, Roberta, would you like to share some words with how you are, you and your organization are doing great work contributing to the sustainability of our island? Thank you, Sheila. Uh, thank you, Sammy, for hosting this social little gathering. It's nice to see everybody. Uh, yes, we just briefly um, have been working on this Bring Back Our Trees campaign. It's uh, funded by Department of Interior. 
and it, it runs through September of this year, but we've been able to plant 800 trees on native species in conjunction with the advice and consent of people from the Division of Forestry here. And also we're working very closely with a lot of volunteer groups. And so we feel that, you know, we're, we're moving towards the goal. I totally agree with Pete's idea of having private landowners also join in the effort of planting trees on private property. We've been focused on coastal areas and uh, priority watersheds to stop the erosion caused by a lot of trees being lost during uh, typhoons, Sotolor and YouTube. So right now we are in the process, I didn't mean on my chat, we're not watering, but we are now watering. <laughs> Uh, our team is going out three times a week with the big water buffalo that was donated and we are watering the trees and uh, hopefully we'll see some good survival rates. So that's about it. Yes. And we do work on island sustainability, environmental issues all the time. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Roberta. We do see here Miss Deborah Ellen with her hand raised. I'm unmuted. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just wanted to um, say hello to also to Dr. Underwood. I see his head kind of popping in and out. It's good to have him back on island. Um, one of the things that keeps coming up, um, and I've been an educator for many years, currently at GCC. Um, but for me, a thing that keeps coming up is about, and I mentioned it in the chat thing, is place-based education. Um, and just the importance of that. Um, I've heard about being rooted uh, from Professor Diaz. And I know um, this whole thing about that connection and understanding the, the way that we are connected with the place that we're in, as well as the whole planet. And I do feel as an educator, I can say that a lot of what we've done with, with Western education is we've disconnected our, our, ourselves and others from where we are and from that interconnectedness. Um, and so to that end, we've been trying to have this conversation and I know Dr. Underwood has also been part of this um, in looking at how we could maybe change or reimagine education on Guam, at, at least on Guam. Um, so I know that like say for example, a lot of uh, people coming from our different islands coming to Guam and the first thing they have to do is learn English. And I understand English is important, um, but I also believe that our, everybody's own native languages are important. Um, and that there are things that are part of the values that are within the languages and things like that. Um, so I'm just wondering in terms of um, uh, even uh, our navigator here, Larry, and some of the others, um, our thoughts on maybe trying to develop more educational programs or schools on Guam uh, that can address that those ideas of needing to help children understand their connectedness to nature and to their places. Um, what are their thoughts on having a school like that on Guam? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll just end it with that because we could I could also go on for a long time in terms of my passions in this area of um, having children reconnect with nature in particular and where they where they live their places their cultures and languages. Thank you. Great question. Larry, would you like to respond uh, to Miss Deborah's question about implementing these educational <laughs> types of educational courses um, in our islands? And if that's something that you have um, in YEP and how it's working or not working? There's I think you went to the other Larry. Two there. Larry's here. My bigger brother, Larry Cunningham, doctor. But yes, thank you, Deborah, for the for the comments. Um, I think that uh, what what uh, you're saying is very important in Yap, and I also think maybe in Palau. Uh, but for us in Yap, we've been having, uh, or for some years, uh, it's in, it's imperative on our and our educational system has the cultural program still at the elementary level. So for first, uh, uh, first I think up to three or four 
grades, uh, your your uh, language of teaching, of course, you, you can't be learning anything else from, uh, especially language, you, the kids must learn to speak their language first. Uh, and then of course, all throughout the eight years of primary uh, school, uh, you're learning all the cultural programs uh, from weaving to uh, canoe carving and maybe a simple navigation is being taught at some of our schools. Um, so, and, and I think that it works. My, my uh, I run, as it was stated, I, I co-founded the Wage Institute, or uh, Wage uh, nonprofit organization in YAP, and some of you have had a, a chance to be with us there. I know Keith Harris was there and, and others from, uh, uh, as a group, as well as uh, other friends from abroad, Wage works with young people in the hope of uh, teaching them uh, indigenous knowledge in in seafaring, and the other component of it is on weaving. So the women do that. We've been doing this for the past ten years. Uh, actually, the 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 genesis of Wage was that we notice there is a trend of, of our people from the remote outer islands now moving to the center. And as you probably heard this from me before, we move because we've also tasted Coca-Cola out in these small, tiny atolls. And, and uh, the only way we could get uh, uh, the Coca-Cola is to participate in the cash economy. So that becomes our, in my own opinion, uh, primary reason of moving in addition to the others, the opportunities in school, in education, in health, and whatever. So there is a, a good, a steady uh, movement of people from these remote islands to the center for that. And and of course, we all know that that, that not in the too distant future we're going to be forced to relocate, perhaps because of climate change and all the impact of it. Now that's it. Uh, the program Morgan was aimed at having to work with our, especially the Remetov kids who are now born and raised in the urban, urban, so to speak, state of Yap, because Yap itself is also uh, the state, the center island is growing. We, we have Coca-Cola there and there is electricity and running water, not in our remote outer islands. So. Uh, but things are changing, and I think that uh, it is imperative, or it, I, I believe that education systems uh, across this region should seriously look at how we can do that, uh, Deborah, to work with this, uh, uh, what is it, space in... Uh, where you're able to teach the kids about the place uh, where they come from and their space. And I, I am convinced also that the cognitive thinking of, of kids really does uh, also pair well with uh, indigenous knowledge. You know, I, I know it from my own experience when, um, and also watching kids growing up in these remote islands, it's it's uh, critical. Critical thinking is valuable uh, thing for uh, indigenous knowledge. You know, so I'm I'm with you on that point, and I'm here uh, helping at the at the Sea Grand. Uh, I know Dr. Cunningham, like the other Larry, worked initially on getting a. Uh, uh, a course, a seafaring program here at the university, uh, but we haven't gotten to that stage since you left. Uh, Dr. Underwood and I talked many times about canoe program stuff. So maybe, maybe we should be pulling in, reeling in Department of Education and, and program. I'm convinced the university is in a good position uh, because on the part of the region to work alongside with the other universities to ensure at least seafaring component uh, and seafaring in the sense that it encompasses a whole lot of other sacred knowledge that can be taught 
along with the values of uh, that uh, realm, the sacred realm that we're working with. I know that there are plenty. I'm the I'm I would I'll be the first one to admit that there are greater navigators that are uh, greater than me, and there are greater teachers in all walks of this sacred knowledge that have yet to be tapped. And I can I I have a, a a strong belief that if if they're offered that opportunity to do so that they will you know sometimes it's difficult i'm one of one of them that may have had the the experience outside and and er, earn the credential so to speak that maybe the university level can take but this these folks uh, don't have that credentials the western credentials of having to teach their knowledge is that something that the the islands and the education system can consider uh, to allow because they they hold these are wealth of knowledge in matter of time they will take it to that richest place the richest place that we speak of so often which is six feet on the ground and if we're if we don't value that then our future uh, don't see the need in it then maybe that's a but I think that it, it deserves to be uh, brought to the forefront and be taught to our children. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Master Navigator Larry, about uh, you know, education about sailing and you know our island traditions is so important for what we see now is keeping a sustainable you know, future and, and all of that. So I see a lot of conversation in the chat room, which is beautiful. That's what we want. We want these, these kind of events to facilitate conversations that then lead to action and change. I see a lot of comments about changing things on the policy level and really including curriculum that, that speaks to our, our cultures and traditions and not just um, US education. Um, so I'm so happy that there are so many people that are engaged and wanna have, you know, communicate with us. So we have in the uh, chat a hand raised by Fanua Ababa. I hope I said that right. Are you on camera? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm right here. Hi. Yeah, my name's Fanua Ibabao. Uh, I'm coming from uh, California right now, but uh, my family is Filipino and um, European. And uh, if I connected with you during this call, it's because I, I'm like overwhelmed with all the excitement and celebration of being with you all. Um, feeling like uh, I'm part of the family that that there's lots of people out there who are also interested in um, not just digging deep into the roots of our uh, ancestral experience, but also bringing them forward to the future. And uh, I know a lot of, I have a lot of peers and, and mentors who are also trying to do this work in California. Um, we built our first bunka by hand with a, uh, a gifted, log from one of the Tongva people of L native LA um, and uh, we have a lot of relatives here who are working with the the indigenous people of this land and and um, among the Filipino diaspora and the Filipino American uh, people and um, I've been a part of the family there I've grown up a lot of, around a lot of the natives uh, of this land and um, I grew up in the Philippines on my uh, on my native land there too, and um, being in in California, uh, there's a lot of us who are working and so um, who are working to to build stuff. I've been I've been working with my hands or with the wood. I've been building paddles for the crew members, um, trying to talk to more people about. Uh, well, just trying to come together, trying to make as many. Uh, ally as many allies as we can um, especially right now this is such an amazing opportunity so thank you to all of you who helped to put this on and are holding the 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 space and the it's it's so amazing that that i'm here with you all i feel very grateful um so without uh further ado just i'll pass it back to you um and thank you all so much and uh please uh if I don't start a conversation with you, or I, I can't wait to be in conversation with you all. So um, I look forward to, to that. Thank you. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Fenua, for sharing. And we're so happy and grateful that all the way from California, you're joining us. So thank you for sharing um, and showing us a display of what you've been working on. Um, I do see a good friend, Eva Cruz. She uh, works with Inafamalik Youth Sanctuary Incorporated on Guam. She works with our youth and is doing amazing work. Eva, it's so nice to see you. Are you there? Buenas. Um, buenas tardes, Hamzu. Hafade. Tiro. Kalofa. Aloha. Kasalele. Yokwe. Uh, Rananin um, across our region. I'm very honored for you to call on me. I'm very honored to be a part of this circle. Um, thank you, UOG uh, Center for Island Sustainability for all of the good work that you're doing in our community. And um, thank you to our hosts, of course, and our um, navigators and our scholars who are featured here today, and all of the people who are contributing to the work um, in any way. Um, again, it's an honor. Thank you for allowing me to speak at this time. I do wanna share uh, a little bit about, uh, it, dive into the conversation about uh, educational programs as I am a part of one right now. Um, I was a Chamar language teacher for the past five years, but I recently transitioned to be a part of Sanctuary Incorporated. And I'm now running a program called Enough at Malik Youth. Uh, which is connecting uh, the youth to our roots and our future. And so we have had the privilege to have uh, Saina Larry um, uh, with us, uh, partnering with TASA um, to, to share with our youth. Uh, we did an intensive unit over the Christmas break, over the holiday camp, and um, he, he was able to share, uh, teach about, about his experiences, um, in, in the seafaring in his seafaring upbringing, um, shared about our uh, learning about the uh, we had our youth learning about the star compass, learning names of the stars. They actually got to go out on the canoes um, out at Boat Basin. We were um, we were weaving the the thatch for the oud. Um, I see Kia. She was also with us in that <laughs> one of the so, um, you know, it's happening, right? The Miss Debbie, uh, we went to Palau for Piba and, and we had, we were having these, these conversations and there's definitely a shift that's, that's present in, in our collective community mindset about education and what the focus of education should be. And we always talk about it, but it's, it's really about bringing all of our organizations together so that we can, we can, we can focus our efforts so that all of, all of the, the components that are happening, you know, can, can, can realize that goal. And, and especially, I think one of the things is to, to influence policy, right? Because we have all the existing curriculums, like the knowledge is there, but it's connecting it to the policy and what the practice is for educators. Um, and so my program is uh, one of the, is one of, it, it, it's a program that offers that for youth. Um, and yeah, I'm just, uh, we'll be starting, uh, we'll be starting our new engagement. You know, I think COVID, the COVID times and the ways that we've had to adjust really present a unique opportunity for us because we're gonna see the Department of Education and, and um, shifting to new ways of teaching and new ways of engaging the youth. And that might be, you know, that might be the best place for us to, to come in and, and reintroduce our ways of learning and our ways of knowing, right? Because youth are gonna be at home. They're gonna have to be applying knowledge that's like, that's relevant for the place that's around them. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really, again, excited to be a part of this conversation. I'm excited to connect with you all after this. And um, please look, be on the lookout if you know any youth um, ages 13 to 17. We will be launching an online engagement which will involve a lot of uh, a lot of posting, um, a posting, and 
um, digging deep into, into the, the youth's uh, family stories and their genealogies, right? We'll have these challenges for them to do to engage with their culture and with their surroundings. We'll be featuring elders um, um, speaking about their stories in tutorials with cultural practitioners. So if you know any indigenous youth ages 13, or sorry, 12 to 17, um, just be on the lookout for Inafamalic Youth, which will be coming up. And if you are a cultural practitioner or um, possessor of knowledge, or if you have stories, you know, that will that you can share and experiences to connect with the youth, please get a hold of me. I am Eva Cruz from Inafamalic Youth, and we have uh, we have a website uh, that's that should be coming up soon. It's inafamalicyouth.org. And if not, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. I'm Sidzo Smathi, Taras Hamzu, and you all have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you so much, Eva, that, you know, your passion, it, it truly shows. And you're right, this work is actually, um, we're doing this work. I know that we're doing this work on Saitan with 500 Sales. They have their Lalazic classes. I was fortunate to be a part of a cohort that enabled me to sail from Saipan to Tinian and then do a, um, you know, a, a quick one week program on Tinian with the youth there. So we are, you know, our individual organizations are doing this and it's kind of a matter of connecting and seeing what we're all doing and how we can make this, you know, something across the region. So thank you for those points. Um, we are at time, but before we go, we would love to take a group photo which means we're gonna take a screenshot. <laughs> so if we can have everybody with their cameras on, um, get ready to smile. Um, I think one of the UOG team members will take the photo. See or no? Where's the UOG team at? Count for us, Sammy. Count, count down for us. <laughs> oh, count down? Okay. Well, that, but that ruins my smile because what if it lags? No. <laughs> All right, we're going to smile in three, two, and smile. Did we do it? Is it done? We got a thumbs up from your G. Awesome. Okay, yay. So, again, Thank you all so much for staying with us um, in the virtual reception, as well as joining us this morning. Um, such a beautiful conversation. Um, we are so blessed to be here with you all, to have this privilege to connect virtually, um, while maintaining you know, physical distancing practices. And I think this actually turned out better because we can all, you know, everybody, you know, people who are not able to go to Guam for the, the conference when it was originally scheduled have now been able to join us. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. Yes, it was so inspiring to hear about all the wonderful work happening um, in your communities and just across the world. And so we hope to continue supporting one another and learning from each other. We encourage you all to reach out and continue this connection. Um, we are going to leave the Zoom room open for another 10 minutes or so, just to give you all a chance to, you can also privately message one another for some contact information. Um, and so we definitely encourage you to do that. We hope that you can join us for our next session uh, next week, same time. Um, and we'll be discussing women business leaders, sustainability solutionaries. Thank you all for your time. And we hope that you enjoy the free 10 minutes. If not, have a great day.